Jonah is divided very simply into two parts, chapters one and two, and then chapters three and four. And that chapter one and two talk about the call of Jonah, his disobedience, its results, and then the mercy of God. And in chapters three and four, we see the recall of Jonah, his obedience and its results. And once again, the great mercy of God in dealing with one of his rather recalcitrant children. I'm reading those simple verses in Jonah chapter three and four. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. The visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God, which means that Jonah delivered that message in the name of Jehovah by implication. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned away from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee, to Tarshish. I knew that you were gracious and compassionate, God, slow to anger and abounded in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter and sat in the shade and waited to see what would happen in this, to the city. Then the Lord God provided a vine or a gourd and made it grow up over Jonah to give him shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. 
But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? Now, to me, the most thrilling part of the book of Jonah is in these two chapters, three and four. It's not that chapters one and two are not astonishing enough. Being swallowed by a great fish has to be astonishing by anybody's reference, such a thing. But here in chapter three, we read of a whole city of more than 120,000 people repenting of their sin and not in the name of their own gods or gods, but in the name of Jonah's God, in the name of Jehovah, Yahweh. There are two great Bible truths here. The first of them is this, that God will accept true repentance, even from those who have walked far from him and failed him very greatly. The second great Bible truth here in this passage is that God will accept and care for his own dear children. Even they have failed him and hurt him and fallen away from him in many, many different ways. They're under the totally committed love of God and care of God for all time. And as we sang in the last verse of that hymn, for all eternity too. This text, that salvation is from the Lord. Some verses, uh, some different versions of the Bible use the word deliverance that deliverance is from the Lord. Now, that name, salvation, is Jesus' name. In the Hebrew, it's Yeshua, spelt exactly the same way as Jesus' name is, if you write it in Hebrew. There's only one difference, and that is that there is one added letter right at the end of the word, so that it reads, Yeshua's. In other words, salvations. It's the ending in Hebrew for the plural, one of the plural endings. There are several. So we should read this, that deliverances come from the Lord. And these people in Nineveh were surely delivered. There is a difference between what I call ordinary deliverances and this great deliverance which they experienced. I was one day up in Norfolk when I was a pastor of this Baptist church, walking along with my wife and two friends who were church, churches. I don't think they were church members. And I know that it was Rachel on the inside of the pavement, then it was Janet, then it was John, and because the pavement wasn't wide enough, I was in the gutter, walking along, because I wanted to be speaking with John. 
And suddenly, without any warning whatsoever, John just grabbed me and hurled me onto the pavement. And before I'd even thought what was happening, really, a car just went whoosh straight by with its wheels right where I was walking. Now, whether the fellow had just simply, temporarily been looking at something else and lost control of his car, or whether he was out to get me, I don't know. <laughs> but one way or another, that was a deliverance of God. I could give you many more. I don't think I need to because you're, I believe you have had your own. I think there are many times in your life when God's brought you a deliverance. But now just let me briefly take you to South Wales, to a field in Pembrokeshire, one August evening, where I ran, literally ran, into a ridge tent and immediately knelt down beside a bed between two people I didn't like very much, one an older person, much older than me, one a person younger than me, and there I repented of my sins, told God that I loved him because he had what, what he'd done for me on Calvary, on the cross, and I invited the Lord Jesus into my life to be my saviour and my friend. When I got up and went out from that tent, it was as if the grass were about two feet underneath me. I felt as though I were floating. And for the next two months, I felt so absolutely amazed with my salvation that I felt as though I were walking around on tiptoe. That was the deliverance. I think as I look at you tonight, I think that each of you have probably shared in some way, it would be different to mine, but in some way, that same great deliverance. Yes, the people of Nineveh did have that great deliverance. Jesus himself said that the people of Nineveh would rise up in judgment against Jesus' own generation and those Pharisees and scribes and so on who wouldn't accept him because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. That's Matthew 12, 41. They will rise up and condemn that generation on the day of judgment. I don't know of anywhere in scripture or out of scripture where 120,000 people have all been saved at one time. If you do not know one, tell me, I don't know it. I do know of a much smaller city that God reduced to rubble, to charred ashes, because their ways were abominable, because they wouldn't accept God. Although God sent people there to try and show that there was a better way, they wouldn't change. And at long last, God's judgment came down upon them from the sky. Their evil behaviour was abhorrent to God. And in the end, that God who hates to bring calamity had to judge them. Now, let me just say this. I know that you know it. But let me say it immediately. That it's not just the huge sins. I mean, Nineveh was known for its violence for its cruelty, abominable cruelty. But it's not just that. The smallest lie, the trace of unkindness, the mere presence of 
envy. Because someone else has got something you want. Doesn't matter what it is. Or in themselves that they've got greater gifts than you have. Greater abilities. It doesn't matter. Greater health. It doesn't matter. If we have envy and pride and immorality in our lives, and dare I suggest that if I judge people by my own standards, you have some of this too. Then that also is something that saddens God greatly and something for which our Lord Jesus died. As the Apostle Paul, um, John, wrote in 1 John 3, and I've already mentioned this tonight, how great is the love of God that he has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God and that we are. In Psalm 36 and verse 7, the writer David says that God's love is priceless. There's no heap of gold that could ever compare with the love of God. What cost did Jesus have to bear to hang on the cross for us? It doesn't matter whether we've been a Christian as long as Barry Kempson has or longer. We have not yet plumbed the depth of his love or indeed of his sufferings. And every time I read, I come, you, you know what my pattern is, don't you? That I read um, the Gospels, one after the other, continuously. And I've done so for maybe 15, 20 years. As soon as I've finished Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, I go back once again to Matthew. And when I come to those chapters at the end, or two thirds of the way through, about my dear Lord facing up to what was ahead of him and then going forward to die on the cross, I can, sometimes I can hardly read those words. I just want to hurry over them and get them out and come to the resurrection day. What was that cost? Paul said, to the Ephesian Christians, that he was praying for those believers that they might grasp how wide, how long, and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love which surpasses knowledge, said Paul. I don't know how many of you have heard of the Hollingsworth family, this lovely Christian family in America who sing. But they sing a song which is very precious to me. It's called 10,000 Angels, and it goes like this. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame, they spat upon the Saviour, so pure and free from sin, they said crucify him, he's to blame. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy this world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. Upon his precious head, they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and they said, behold the king. They struck him. And they cursed him and they mocked his holy name. 
and all alone, he suffered everything. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy this world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. Let's turn back to Jonah and let's see that recall of Jonah to service. God was going to make sure that Jonah reached that destination. There's no doubt about that. God was way ahead of Jonah. As Jonah made his way to the beach at Joppa where the boat was tied up, God was already preparing a great storm to come and engulf that boat until Jonah was thrown overboard. As Jonah laid down to sleep, snoring, apparently, and happy in his escape from God, God was ordering a great fish into his path to open its mouth at the right time and take him in. As Jonah was thrown into the surging water, God was already patiently waiting for him on the shore to give him the recall to service. And as Jonah plodded his miserable way towards Nineveh, God was busy preparing a whole city to save it. It would seem, as one reads this passage, that Jonah was vomited back on almost to the same place that he left, near Joppa. There are several reasons for that, which we needn't go into really, except that most of the seaweed and things that he was engulfed in are fairly close to the shore. But also that the men in the boat tried to row back to where they'd come from. And they wouldn't have tried to row very far in a furious storm. They were just hoping they'd have the strength to make it back to Joppa. Jesus said that Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites. He didn't, Jesus didn't explain that. But it indicates that somehow what Jonah experienced in his refusal to want God's will, in his being thrown out of the boat in the storm, in his being vomited up onto the land and still alive, was a story that somehow spread very, very quickly. Maybe some of the people in the boat met him. We don't, we're not told. But we do know that the story spread, and it spread all those miles to Nineveh. For Jonah before he even reached there, was a sign to the Ninevites. Well, as I say, we're not told very much about it. It is strange that the main god of the people of Nineveh was a fish. You can see it's scaly back, its mouth open at the top, coming down here, but it's also got a human being, as it were, wrapped up inside that fish. There are many, many different um, wall engravings and so on of, of Dagon, their god. But it is strange. Perhaps the people at Nineveh um, somehow did connect what happened to Jonah with their own god. A great fish saves Jonah. Well, our god's a great fish. Now, we're not told, so I'm not going to try and presume anything here. But it does seem, if so, maybe that was a sign to them and the source of the sign. 
But certainly, when they repented, they didn't repent in Dagon's name, they repented in God's name. We read that from what the king said in his proclamation. By the way, just in passing, you see the bottom picture there. Note the similarity between the fish mouth being opened on Dagon's head and the modern bishop's mitre, <laughs> as I put here. Coincidence? Or what? <laughs> You'll have to do your own research and study on that. But many of us believe and have good reason for thinking that, um, indeed, there is a connection between the, the modern bishop's mitre and the fish god Dag Dagon. Certainly, one thing is clear. God will not give his glory to another. Their repentance was not going to be in Dagon's name. It was going to be in Jehovah's name. Now, as I was thinking, you know, about Jonah, again, this is another sort of insert, really. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about all those other unlikely people that God has called to his service. Who would think that God would use someone like Gideon, scared out of his wits, threshing corn down inside that, um, you know, whatever it was that he was in, the pit that he was in. Who would think that God would call David away from the sheep on the hill and call him to service? Uh, and of course, what about Moses, who was put in that basket? That was kind of his coffin. The family didn't know whether he'd be rescued or not. What about four fishermen? <laughs> to start off the spread of the Christian gospel? What about Saul of Tarsus, the hated enemy of the Christian church? Why should God call an apprentice shoemaker to do his will and to take the gospel to India? And how many times William Carey translated the Bible into how many languages, I don't know. But it was something like 20. He also founded the biggest theological college in the whole of India, which is still the biggest school in India today, in Serampore. What an amazing man. And there he was up in that little place in Northampton, minding his own business. And God called him. What about the very, very successful businessman, Dwight L. Moody? How is it that God called him away from being a successful businessman and making money to become one of the world's most famous evangelists of all time? And my mind went to the women. What about Irene Webster Smith, a serving maid in Ireland? And God calls her to go out all on her own to Japan, where in the course of the rest of her life, she experiences so many miracles of God and helps thousands and thousands of children who were the unwanted offspring from the prostitutes of Tokyo. And what about Gladys Aylward? And one could go on and on and on. Listen, God knows us. God knows what we can do. God knows where we are. And God can choose us to do whatever he chooses us to do. And we needn't worry because someone's more successful or someone's better at this or better than that. As long as we're in the will of God, let him do with us what he will. So Jonah was called back to service. And then Jonah's obedience and the results of it, well, that was a long slog up to Nineveh. 350.8 miles. 
are the quickest road route. That's probably today, because I got it off the internet to find out. And he was an unhappy bunny when he went, wasn't he? My goodness me. He had all that time to think, all that time to ponder what God was doing and what he wanted him to do. And he wasn't really wanting it at all. You know, sometimes when things, even bad things, happen quickly, we can somehow handle them. When they're spread out over a long period of time, they become much, much more difficult to cope with. My mind went to Mary and Martha. Do you remember their story? It, 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 it's best summed up in that lovely song, Four Days Late. The news came to Jesus. Please, come fast. Lazarus is ill, and without your help he will not last. Mary and Martha watched their brother die. They waited for Jesus, but he did not come, and they wondered why. Have you ever felt like that? Well, Jesus did come four days late. But with Jesus, he was still on time. And that great miracle occurred there. Faith, our faith, is often tested. And time and pondering about these things is one of the ways it's tested. Does this testing draw us closer to God or further away from him? Will you turn to Lamentations? The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It's good for a man to bear the yoke when he is young. And then verse 32, though he brings grief, that is the Lord. He will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love, for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. So Jonah arrived in Nineveh, the greatest city probably, of its time. Henrietta Mears describes that city this way, it's very simple. It's on the east bank of the Tigris, 400 miles from the Mediterranean, the capital of Assyria. The stronghold of the city was 30 miles long and 10 miles wide. It was marvelous in appearance, five walls and three moats surrounded it. The walls were between 50 and 100 foot high and allowed four chariots to be driven abreast along it. The palaces were great and beautiful with the finest of gardens. Fifteen gates guarded by colossal lions and bulls opened into the city. Seventy halls were decorated magnificently in alabaster and sculpture. The temple in the city was in the form of a great pyramid that glittered in the sun. But it was fortunate, unfortunately also a city of great wickedness. And that's where Jonah went. He didn't hesitate. <laughs> he wasn't pleased with God, but he walked straight in. And he declared, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. And all of the men from least to greatest humbled themselves. And it's amazing, the king took off his royal robes, sat in dust and ash in sackcloth. He made this proclamation, which proclaims to me, by the way, real repentance, that they were to fast, even the animals, no food, no water, that they were to give up their violent ways and their evil lives, 
and they were to call urgently upon God. And God saw it was real. And he had compassion on them. And he didn't bring destruction. He delighted to see it. As he does with any of us. In Hebrews 3.9 we read, He's patient with you, not wanting that anyone should perish, but that everyone should come to repentance. Repentance, in its Greek, means after mind, or literally, if you like, change mind. And that's what those people in Nineveh did. They repented before God, and God accepted it. And that's what Jesus said, I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. At Pentecost, when people asked Peter what they should do when they heard about Jesus, his answer was, first of all, repent and be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ and your sins will be forgiven. You know, I'm not going to go into it now, there's not time, of course, but possibly the preaching of repentance is the great absentee in modern Christian preaching. We preach the love of God to everyone, but we don't preach repentance because we think that's going to put people off. And it may well be but it's the preaching of repentance that will bring people to Christ, not send them away from him. So let's see um, God's great mercy to Jonah to finish with. He did as what God wanted. And when he had done it, he went out to the east of the city and made himself a little shelter and sat down to see what would happen. Right, do you know another person who also set out on a mission for God from Joppa? It was Simon Peter, when he was called to go to Cornelius. And Cornelius was considered in Jewish eyes another enemy, just like Nineveh was to Jonah. Both of them went, and both of them saw results despite what was going on in the hearts of those servants. I don't know what Peter was really thinking, but he believed that God had shown him that anybody that he calls sacred and holy is, even if he didn't like them. <laughs> Not Jonah. The author of Gulliver's Travels, Jonathan Swift, possibly wrote the best little poem about um, Jonah that you could ever want, or about all Jews. We are God's chosen few. All others, be damned. There's no place in heaven for you. We can't have heaven crammed. That was, that was Jonah. He, he, didn't, he didn't want these people of Nineveh in heaven. He was quite happy that it should be for Jesus only. He didn't realise, by the way, that God was treating him in exactly the same way that God was treating Nineveh, with compassion, with kindness, with gentleness, and with love. And those verses through to the end of the chapter, short as they are, show us just how God endeavoured to get a, a message about that across to his rather unhappy servant. First of all, he made this gourd grow. We don't know, we're not told what plant it is. NRV called it a vine. Other versions called it a bean plant. <laughs> we don't know, but it grew up jolly quickly. And Jonah, it says, was pleased with it. So he was much happier. Now he could look in his disgruntled way at Nineveh and be happy about it. <laughs> For the first time, God questions him. He said, do you have any right to be angry? Perhaps in that moment of being sheltered 
Jonah might have possibly said, oh, I don't know. But then come the morning, a load of worms come and gobble up the plant. And then on top of that, as the sun begins to shine, God sends a great east wind, scorching wind. I imagine that Jonah may have been a little bit like me, you know, sort of devoid of rather much hair on top. And <laughs> he felt it badly. He was back to the worst of his grumpy ways. But once again, God comes to him and says, Jonah, Jonah, do you have any right to be angry? Don't you realize that Nineveh has more than 120,000 people and they're so unintelligent, so easily led, that they can't even tell their left hand from their right hand. He said they're, they're all simpletons. They're ignorant. They haven't had the privileges that you have had, Jonah. You've got to understand that. You didn't make that good, Jonah. I did. You didn't let it be gobbled up with worms. I did. You didn't bring about that scorching wind that made you knot a handkerchief over your head. I did. And I hope that it's worked. I want to finish by saying I believe it did. The very fact that Jonah actually recorded these things, because it must have been him who recorded this, the very fact that he recorded it, and it's down in scripture, seems to convince me that what God said to Jonah worked. That may be an assumption. But as God opened his heart to Jonah, I believe that long, long last, Jonah had his heart and mind opened to what God was doing. Because the book is here. Out of all the books in the Old Testament, I was going to say out of all the books in the New Testament too, there is not a book that shows the love of God towards sinners as this one does. Jo Jonah wrote of his experience. And he summed it up by saying, Yes, salvation, deliverance, is from the Lord. He learned, I believe, and may we too. And in the light of that knowledge of what God's love is, may we be willing to serve him, whatever he tells us to do even though it may be ever such a small thing. Let's bow to him and love him, for he is our God, the God of our salvation. Amen.